um, and distribution. Uh, so I don't know anything about gaming. Um, so I'm here to learn. Fantastic. Donna, could you tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure. Um, I'm the author of Business Decision Making for Dummies, and I've been working on the edge of business innovation for the last decade. So that's really about redesigning company cultures. And why I'm interested in gaming is to create a game uh, wow. to redesign a business culture for prosperity instead of just profit. Very interesting. Grant, uh, is your audio on? I think so. Can it you hear is. me? Yes, we sure, sure can. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, I'm just uh, stepping into a conference room as we do this. Um, so I'm the CEO of a learning game company that's uh, backed by Idea Lab in Pasadena. And we are building a game that teaches kids five to eight about computer science concepts. Um, and we're currently have a beta version of the game. Um, and that's it, I guess. That's what we're up to. Great. Actually, Grant, I think you and I met uh, in Bay Pasadena a few weeks ago. Uh, yeah, we did. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I know it's hard to see. I'm kind of tiny in this frame here. Well, um, sorry, and I'm also, like, I was in the middle of walking to a conference room through the <laughs> Idea Lab offices. Very good. Well, Kevin, thank you so much for joining us. We are live now at the broadcast, and I'm really excited about uh, this particular uh, course and teacher because he's so talented and creative and excited about this world of game design. And having reviewed his his outline for the course and having had a couple conversations with him, both about the process of game design, but also the reason why we play games, it's really fascinating. So I really want to structure this uh, hangout in a, in a simple way, which is to go over some of the basics, but also to gather at the beginning just some real basic questions that we have from Sebastian, Grant, Donna, or AJ. So I'm going to start with uh, just throwing out some questions, and then we'll get into some of the, the content. Um, some of you may have come today just wanting to listen, and some of you may, may have come with very specific questions. So I want to touch with the specific ones first. Um, is anyone wanting to just ask out loud, or do you want to type in the chat box? Either would be fine. Yeah. Um, I, I, my question, I've, I've been reading Reality is Broken, and I've been looking at games for about five years, uh -huh. six years actually. And so I'm really looking for what are the principles that you use to bridge games from online into life? Ah, let's see. Well, I think the first first thing to think about with, with games is that um, all games are predicated on learning. The, the act of playing a game is, is, is always the act of learning, um, which is why, why we're wired to do them instinctively in the first place. And certainly that's something that, that uh, Jamie Goddard talks about in, in her book. Um, I think as far as, uh, as far as bridging a game into real life, I think, uh, I think the most effective way to do that, in my mind, is to uh, is to focus on the dynamics of the game that you're uh, that 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 you're designing. Focus on what's the experience of the person playing it, and especially what choices are they making as as they play this game. What uh, you know, what what moves, what choices do they make, what uh, what distinctions do they make, what plans do they make, and then what uh, what what results can they perceive from it. And um, in draw analogies between that and the uh, and and the the you know. Uh, and a, you know, extra diegetic subject that you're trying to teach. You know, so you've got the world inside the game, um, in which your player is making distinctions and, and you know drawing conclusions about how the game works and drawing conclusions about what they think they should do as a result of their understanding and then seeing whether or not they work. And then uh, and then be thinking as well about what somebody out in the real world would need to would need to learn or need to get good at to get good at the subject that you're trying to teach them and see whether or not the distinctions you're asking them to make in the game are in any way analogous to the distinctions that, that you're asking them to make out in the real world. And so I, th I think what I'm, what I'm getting at here is that it doesn't need to be a literal correlation. Um, but I think, the, uh, I, think, I think to be effective in, as, a, uh, as a teaching game, it does need to uh, it does need to prompt the same kind of mechanisms of thought that you're uh, that you're trying to uh, trying to bring about. I don't know. So, does that does that make sense? Kevin, so Kevin, I, 
I think I think that's a great answer, and um, I want to get as specific as possible. So, when if we could just use uh, another example to illustrate that concept, um, and and Donna, maybe it makes the most sense for you to throw out a scenario. Can you tell us? Uh, give me a scenario, and and let Kevin just think about that and and share some ideas. Sure, that'd be great. Um, I have uh, a client coming up, and they want to do uh, they want to articulate the vision for their company, and I've been thinking. Um, how to how to do it? How to co-design? Uh, well, there's a couple of things, but let's just tackle that particular experience. So it's one where where I would use games to create their to pull out or to generate their vision for what they want their company to do. Um, so I'm I'm looking at at questions. You know how you would frame it, how you'd set it up, like just just a playful way of doing something that brings out the future in each of them. Interesting. Okay. Um, is that is that good, Mike? <laughs> yeah. So yeah, it's, I think at the at the core, it talks about you know what you hope to achieve with your game and who you're who you're targeting as the person who would be playing the game. I think it does set up a challenge, and yeah. I think Kevin is is probably uh, you know thinking about that challenge. But Kevin, how could we make this uh, goal? Something into a to gamify or to make it fun or playful or or start to test. Hi, uh, let's see. Well, I mean, it, it's it's tough without knowing really anything about the company. But I think in in general, it, probably where I would begin first, if if the if the goal of the game is to get people to understand and experience the vision and purpose of the company, then I think the first thing to do is to explore the the vision of that of that company in, in terms of in terms of why why. Why is why is this vision the way it is? What's it for? What is it? What is it achieving? Um, Kevin, it's not to it's not to sell or tell a vision. It's okay. to co-create one. Got it. Got it. So okay. so the kind of thing I've been thinking about is is it's a in this case it's a landscape architecture firm. They're creative by definition. So the kind of thing I was thinking about is giving them a task question that would have them go and find a found object, but then a way of building it. You know, using the game. Um, uh, principles to build the discussion to an outcome where the company it, they co-create the vision with everybody participating. Got it. Okay. Okay, that makes sense. So, uh, so really, then, then as uh, you know, if, if it's an exploration of you know, it's a finding of the company's vision, then um, then then yeah, I think the the, the appropriate process is to uh, is to engage the problems that the company exists to solve. And so, as you say, if it's a landscape architecture firm, then uh, then the problems they're trying to solve is to you know create presumably an, an aesthetically pleasing landscape architecture that's you know sustainable, that's affordable, that's not going to wash away in the first rainstorm, et cetera. And uh, and so I think you could probably approach that in terms of the uh, the the problems that need to be solved uh, by the company or or you know in, in doing the work that the company intends to do and um, and the you know the resources with which they have to solve them, and the and the challenges that they're going to face. You know the you know budgetary constraints, the constraints of space, the constraints of mm. uh, you know you know drainage and the rest of the things, making sure that it's actually going to survive. And then I think probably the the magic sauce there is to figure out um, what's the difference between simply doing this and doing it well, and uh, and allow the allow the process of of, of of developing the game and exploring the game, and, and especially as you as you iterate on your design, uh, figuring out you know figuring out what what makes the difference between simply you know simply doing the work and uh, and and you know doing the work doing the work better or doing the work in a more effective or efficient way, and then uh, and I think that's where the uh, that's where the, the crux of it is going to be. I think the if I think if if the if the goal ultimately is to find a vision for a company, then ultimately that vision is going to be presumably you know, their differentiator. What do they do better than anybody else does? And um, and I think certainly you could find that by exploring that process. I mean, because you know, I mean, almost anything can be made into a game really by by applying goals to it and applying constraints to it. I mean, I. Uh, Again, I want to I want to jump in there too, and just to give people context, because we have different levels of people participating. But I think that's a fantastic point. The main thing being, whatever game idea you're coming up with, 
at its core level, you're creating goals and you're creating constraints. Yeah. So whether that's for a company or for the learning game or something more fun, uh, I just want to make that point. I'll let you dive right back in, Kevin. Yeah, perfect. And, and yeah, I think that's 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 a, a very clear clear way of thinking about it. I mean, so in, in, in jumping back to this, you know, this this question of making a uh, making a landscape architecture game, you would you would need to articulate what are the goals. You know, what you know what's 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 the thing that needs to happen for a uh, for a person to consider themselves to to have won the game. And you know what are the constraints? What makes this difficult? And and certainly to the degree that they can be analogous to the constraints of the real world, they're going to be, uh, you know, it's it's going to become effective as a teaching tool. Uh, I'm I'm going to jump in again here and and just give people another basic background. So. Uh, you first think about gaming when you think about why we play, and we play because it's a very innate thing that we've been doing since the beginning of time to teach ourselves uh, one thing or another. And so games are a very natural, uh, a natural thing for us to do. But when you're designing a game, you really have to think about it at, at three levels. One is that level which we just discussed, which is the core, the theory, with the goals and the constraints, and the setup. And the next is the mechanics, and that are that's how the, the game is experienced. And the last being the aesthetics, which is more around the feel. So, Kevin, um, you know, just what we have done is here. Let's move on to mechanics. How would we approach the mechanics of this theory of trying to ha have a company come up with their goals? I mean, what are a couple ideas you could throw out? Well, I think I, mean, I think some of the the first things you could do is. Uh, break down the problem in terms of um, in terms of you know, essentially kind of take inventory of what you have. What uh, what pieces do you have available to you? So uh, so for instance, um, some of the mechanical elements of, uh, of for instance a landscape architecture game would be the the terrain in which you're working um, would be the uh, the tools by which you're going to alter that terrain um, objects that you could put onto it. Um, you know, so certainly those those are those are those are elements of it. Those are essentially kind of the the the, the topology of the game would, in this case, kind of be the terrain, the tokens that the player is using within this game probably would be the uh, the objects that you're putting on that terrain, the uh, the tools that you use to manipulate it to change its shape or to move those objects, and then uh, and then in thinking about uh, thinking about the obstacles and the constraints. Um, I'd look at it and say, all right, well, what you know, what sorts of things work against us? Okay, well, we're going to have different shapes of terrains that could cause challenges. Um, certainly, we need to have some way to quantify how well the player's done this. I mean, simply to put things, you know, if if, if simply by putting, you know, a flower pot in the lawn, you've already won the game. Then it's not ultimately going to be much of a game. And so, so we need to figure out what what does that really mean, and that's going to give us, you know, what does what does it mean to uh, to differentiate a an unsuccessful experience from a successful experience, and then a successful experience from a really well played experience. Um, and in thinking about that, I mean um, that that makes that thinking makes clear to you what feedback you need to give your player. Um, those are those in, in, in themselves will be mechanical elements, things that you need to communicate back to your players so they know how they're doing. And um, you know, your constraints that you apply if you say, okay, well, some of the terrain is rocky, so it can't be moved. Okay, good. That's a game, that's an element. That's a mechanical element that goes into the game. Um, some terrain can be easily eroded when it rains. Okay, well, we know that, uh, that you know, rain is prob probably going to be a mechanical event that happens in this game that, uh, that, that, that tests our, our landscape or, or something like that. Uh, and, uh, and the terrain can, you know, can, can change as a result of it. But, I mean, essentially, I mean, I'm, I'm thinking through this right now, but the exercise that I'm doing is uh, is envisioning the things that you would have to do to do this job, and I'm sort of interested in my mind, I'm iterating on what pieces I can identify, what what bits can I can I identify as discrete things and cut out and put onto put onto a list, and probably if I were doing this doing this for real, I would probably be writing these down on, uh, on note cards and laying them out on a table so that I can start to get a sense of the shape of things and start to put them together and, uh, and get a gonna, sense of what I'm I just going to throw in a, a quick uh, analogy here. So we, we're probably all familiar with the Super Mario Brothers game, so that could be a good one. But who is your Bowser? 
Uh, <laughs> in other words, what's the biggest obstacle? And yeah. where, what is your flag? So at the end of each level, you jump and you hit a flag. And the feedback loop to the user is the song, the music, and you get to go on to the next level you watch Mario. So just thinking about things at a very basic level, that's the analogy that, I, that comes to my mind. Yeah, I think those I think those are effective. It's uh, you know, I mean, certainly, uh, you know, when you talk about what's what's your Bowser, that's that's your, you know, what what, you know, what what makes this difficult? I mean, if I, you know, and and, and the way you're and depending on depending on what you're trying to express with the game, it could be it could be a number of things. You, it could be purely, uh, purely topology. I mean, you know, this could really be kind of a Minecraft sort of uh, sort of experience, um, you know, or it could be, uh, you know, maybe. Uh, you know, maybe maybe you've got a, uh, a fictional client in the uh, in the game who's hired you to do this uh, do this design and is either happy or not happy depending on on certain things that have happened or not happened. Maybe you go over budget and your client gets angry, or or the uh, or the client goes and throws uh, you know last minute changes to the specification at you. And, you know, so Kevin, we have one one more live question from Cami, and then I have a question here from Grant that I want to throw out. So, Cami, uh, please uh, go ahead. Hi there. Uh, I saw. I liked how you walked through the landscape uh, model. Is there a way that you can do something very analogous for like the learning the learning domain? Because I know that that's when I joined it, that's, that's what you were talking in, and that's my interest. Can you uh, walk me through what that might look like in terms of the core theory, the mechanics? And sort of the aesthetics pieces, and like, how do we actually think about uh, bringing in gamification, the dirty buzzword, uh, into learning? Yeah, well, um, as I as I mentioned earlier, I mean, all all games are all games are about learning. Games are a mechanism by which we learn, um, or or more specifically, play is a mechanism by which we learn, and games are a structural amplification of play. And so I mean every 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 baby knows how to play before they before they can talk and nobody needs to teach them. Um, your cat knows how to play. It's it's a natural way that we that we learn things. And so uh, so in that way games are already by their nature um, learning devices and learning experiences and, and probably the most powerful learning learn, or teaching devices we, we we have that we're really only beginning to learn how to use that way. Um, as far as approaching a design for a teaching game, I, I, I think the um, I think the way the way I would do that would probably be fairly closely analogous to, uh, to the thought experiment we just did with the um, with the uh, the, uh, the uh, landscape design game, which is that uh, I would uh, I would think about the think about the thing that we're trying to teach. And let's say let's say we were trying to uh, uh, I don't know. I, I mean, well, there's there's the, the the obvious historical example, teaching people how to fly airplanes. I mean, games have been used for, for that for for quite a long time, and that's really what flight simulators are. But in, in, in an instance like that, I mean, what, what you're what you're doing is is looking at the uh, you're looking at the thing that you're trying to teach, and you're figuring out what what differentiates somebody who's good at this thing that I'm trying to teach from somebody who's not yet good at this thing. What um, huh? You know what? What do you have to learn to get to to you know to to what distinctions do you have to make to get good at this? Um, and I, I think I'll break this down in, in more specifically in terms to put it into into game game terms. Um, what what meaningful choices does a person make as they go through the process of doing whatever this thing is that you're trying to teach them to do? And by what what information do they have available uh, to allow them to make those choices, and um, and then uh, what distinctions can they make from that information? And, and what I mean by this is uh, is uh, uh, the process of playing a game is is mostly a process of making uh, making micro plans and then testing them against results. I mean, essentially, when you're when you're playing a game. You're looking at a situation, and saying, "Okay, I'm in this situation. I'm looking at the chessboard, and I can see where the pieces are, and I can see what my 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 personal goal is. You know, either to capture this piece or ultimately to to entrap the uh, the king. Um, and uh, and in looking at that board, looking at that 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 situation, I, uh, I I make distinctions. I say, "Okay, well, I understand by my understanding of the mechanics of the game where my pieces can move. I understand." That if I move this piece in this place, it's going to prompt probably this response from the player. At this point, I'm now making a I'm now making a plan. I'm saying I'm, I'm saying I, I believe that if I do this, this will happen. 
and then and then when I execute the move, I'm now testing that plan. I go and move the piece, and the opponent either does what I thought he was going to do or doesn't do what I thought he was going to do, and my plan is either successful or not quite as successful as I had hoped, and now, now I'm in a new situation and I need to, uh, need to make, make choices about it. Um, so to loop this back to uh, thinking about a teaching game, as you think about the process of a person playing the game, and that's probably how I would approach it, um, so I, I approach it from two sides. I'd, I'd make distinctions about the thing that you're trying to teach. You know, what, what do you have to learn to get good at this, this, this thing? Um, you know, and, and especially why do you have to learn it in this way? I really strongly believe that that effective design grows much more from from what, the why domain than the what domain, if you, if you know what I mean. So I would I'd break down break down this, the topic that you're trying to teach in that way, but I would also run through in my mind hypothetical play experiences of of you know of, of doing this thing and begin to break them down. You begin to begin to identify within these pieces that the player could interact with that could allow them to express the thing that you're trying that you're asking them to do and be, and and uh, and become concrete on the choices that you're asking your player to make and the information that you're giving them with which to make that choice um, there's a very very good book on game design called uh, uh, called rules of play by uh, Katie Salen and Eric Zimmerman it's uh, MIT press and it's a magnificent book their, their core concept is that all game playing is predicated on what they call meaningful, a meaningful choice. And a meaningful choice is a choice for which you have sufficient information to make a distinction about what you should probably do. So, um, so for instance, if I, if, I, if I put my player at a fork in the road and I say, hey, do you want to go right or left, but I give them no information at all about what the ramifications of that choice would be because they have no idea what's to the right or what's to the left, then it's not a meaningful choice. They haven't they haven't used information in any kind of a, in, in any real way to make a distinction and then and then test that distinction and they're really not playing a game. Um, if now I give them some way to, you know, read and understand the terrain and they now make that choice based on their understanding of the feedback that the game system is giving them, and uh, and then test it. Now they really are playing a game and now they're engaged in a learning experience because now they're. They're evaluating their ability to understand the um, the scenario of the game uh, against the reality of it, and that's really, really every uh, the experience of play is always reality testing. Yeah, it's I mean whether whether it's a whether it's a you know a cat batting a ball around the hallway just to see what's going to happen. They're they're essentially reality testing. They're saying, hey, I'm going to try this thing and see what happens and see if it behaves in the way that I think that I think it's going to, and then and then you know presumably try to improve that. Um, so, so Kevin, I'm going to jump in here again and just to back up and give people uh, overview. So the first step here is to uh, yourselves back up and ask yourself why you're making this game, and then that provides the intention for you to be able to create the what, which is the scenarios or scenarios by which you will test the user and yeah. then, it's, then it's important to actually write out the scenarios and and test them. Um, I want to get to Grant's question because he had okay. asked it earlier. Um, how do you balance level difficulty for different ages? Um, you know, I'll tell you a, a brief story I have playing the Duolingo game on my iPad which is a language uh, game and some may not consider it a game but what they've done is they've taken and you lose a heart every time you miss a question and you have to start over. So it, it may just be gamification versus a game, but um, it seemed to be working for many different levels, I would say, because it's so simple. Absolutely, absolutely. I would say um, the, I, th I think the most effective way to deal with difficulty um, difficulty ramping and difficulty leveling is to provide some latitude within that because I mean that's that's a that's a core challenge of, of game design is that you know again I mean, all, all games you know as we've established all, all games are predicated on learning the positive experience of playing a game is uh, is an experience that uh, um, uh, Mihaly Csikszentmihalyi called flow uh, the flow experience is an experience of kind of being in sync with the thing that you're doing. It's 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 that that experience that you that experience of kind of being entranced by a game that you that you fall into if it, if it's really going well, and 
there are a couple of criteria by which flow can be achieved. Um, and most importantly is a balance between the, the challenge presented by the experience and the, uh, and the ability of the person engaging the experience. And so in, in, in Csikszentmihalyi's book, he graphs it out as a, as a diagonal. So if you imagine the challenge presented by the game on the vertical axis and the player's experience on the horizontal axis, you've got an ideal space that kind of runs up that, uh, that, um, that that chart in a uh, in a, a diagonal where if, if you if your challenge is too low for the player's experience they're going to get bored and if the challenge is too great for the player's experience they're going to be frustrated by this now, the problem and, and to get more directly to your to your question the problem there is different people learn at different rates and uh, and they come at your experience with different uh, different precursor experiences and so there's some people who are coming in already good at some of the foundational things that allow them to play uh, play your game well and they're going to in things that are challenging to another player are going to be basic to them um, I think there are a few ways you can you can you can achieve this I think you can uh, you can as I mentioned provide the latitude in the experience by providing a, a range of a range of evaluation between simply completing the experience and completing the experience well. And so, like, I mean, the Mario example, Mario games are a good example where you can simply get through a level with, you know, without without collecting all the stars, without doing all of the all of the side things, but you've still achieved it. You've gotten through it. And for a beginning player, that may be enough. You know, that may be an experience of achievement. But then later on, you can you can you know loop back. And try to capture all the stars, or try to uh, try to achieve these more difficult uh, side objectives. And in so doing, what you're what you're allowing your player to do is make their own distinction about how deeply they want to engage the system of your game. And so you're really allowing them to kind of mediate their own the, their own difficulty of the experience by giving them a, a range of choices as, in, in what they want to do. And you see this even in like some of the some of the most profitable games in the world right now are the really simple ones on the iPhone, like. Uh, you know, Candy Crush Saga and Bubble Witch and Jelly Splash and the rest of those, and they all follow the same pattern, where they ask you to do a fairly simple activity, and then they rate your completion of a level, um, you know, on a on a star rating, and they give you a score, and so you can get through it with only one star, but then you're going to be encouraged to loop back later on and try to get two stars or three stars, and ultimately you're going to have to do that to progress. That becomes a natural way of providing of, of allowing the game. The, the game mechan the game itself to kind of find the uh, find that that point of homeostasis with the player you know that point where it matches the player um, you know by, by by allowing the player to make the choice and then also by by providing you know by allowing the player to get to the point where they really are challenged and then really do their exercise at that point and so they may blow through a couple of the early levels and then uh, and then when they get to the levels that really challenge them, then they start iterating on those. And that's exactly where you want them because that's where they're doing the most learning. Yeah, that's interesting. And I noticed the most interesting thing to me about your answer is you didn't even mention age. And yeah. I think that's just fine. But it, it is true that at some level, you know, kids and adults both have a similar kind of, you know, <laughs> approach to gaming. What do you think about that? I think it's absolutely true. I mean, for sure. I mean, kids and adults have different. You know, I mean, they're 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 at different levels of development. So, I mean, there there are, there are things that or distinctions that an adult is able to make that a kid is simply not able to make. But then also, I mean, a major difference between you know a kid and an adult is just the body of experience you know, that leading to wherever they are now. I mean, the the older you are, the more you've gone through. Uh, so and, and so, in my sense, in my my case, I don't so much think about it in terms of age as I do in terms of um, their their capacity to understand to make distinctions about the game, their capacity to understand what the game is asking them to do, to perceive the information that the game is giving them, and then to make decisions from that information, and you know express them back into the game, uh, whether it's by Moving a piece, or choosing an answer, or whether it's kind of more a physical game of you know, like you know, aiming or moving or whatever. But I think, I think, I think thinking of you know, when you're thinking about age, you're really thinking about the capability of the of the player, and there are a lot of ways in which that capability can can vary. And I mean, certainly anybody who's played played Call of Duty against a 13 year old kid, you know, it's like <laughs> you know, you're going to get destroyed by that kid because he comes home from school at three in the afternoon. 
and does nothing but play this game. I get home from you know this studio probably at nine, and uh, and then this kid's already got six hours of practice on me. And so, so you know, Grant, it's, uh, Grant, I'm just going to suggest to you, based on Kevin's note, that your early levels are acceptable to all ages and then probably as, as you go higher uh, to, to increase the level of difficulty according to that to that challenge latitude. Did you have other questions, Grant, on your point before we keep going? Well, I was just going to make one comment, which is um, while I do think kids and adults uh, generally can enjoy um, you know, the same game in certain contexts, we definitely see some pretty strong differences in our testing between how kids and adults approach a game for the first time. Mm. And in particular, what we see with younger kids is a willingness to just try stuff and just start poking away that adults don't tend to have. <laughs> adults look at a new screen, and it, it's probably, they're a little bit more self-conscious if I'm watching them, of course. But um, adults sort of look and want some direction and some instruction, and kids are willing mm, to just jump more in. More exploratory. Kind of like, oh, what's that do? What's that do? You know? I think so. I think, yeah, I yeah. Think Great distinction. It, it also talks about kind of one of the really important elements, I think, of a, of a compelling game design, which is discoverability. You know, allowing allowing a player to get into your system and and learn what it does by playing with it, and and uh, and especially, I mean, I, I think I think the really interesting thing thing you know that uh, that you that you brought up is that adults tend to be much more concerned than kids about whether or not they're doing it right. And uh, and if you can create an environment in which you've made clear that we're not worried about doing it right yet, we're simply you know just th these are toys you can play with, and um, and the doing it right can come later on. I mean, but allow them to allow them to play. I mean, in, in the same way that uh, if you think about the natural evolution from a simple act of play of just say tossing a ball against a wall or something like that, and, and then the act of turning that act of play into the playing of a game where you now add a goal and say, okay, now you figured out how to toss the ball, now try to toss it so that it hits that square, or try to toss it so that it comes back to your hand without you having to move your hand, or whatever distinction you want to make. At that point, you're beginning to refine the experience, but I think, I, 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 I really like the idea uh, that's sort of implied within this of giving your game a lobby first, where uh, you know where where the experience you know, where you, where you allow people you allow the player to play with the tools and play with the pieces and figure out what they do, and then uh, you know before before you begin to, you know, before you begin to introduce the idea of quote unquote doing it right or the idea of meeting constraints. I mean, I continue to think that that's part of the brilliance of Minecraft. I mean, it didn't surprise me at all that Microsoft bought them for. Two and a half billion dollars last week. I mean, because I mean, the you know, it's it's a masterfully, masterfully discoverable game. I mean, you climb into Minecraft, and the the, the, the first first house you build, you're hooked, and from then on out, then you begin to understand what the you know what it means to play the game well. And 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 the beauty of that experience is, to some degree, it almost doesn't matter. I mean, there are people who never bother to play the game; they simply use it as a toy, and that's fun as well. But yeah, I, I think that's I think that's interesting and interesting. Kevin, can you can you? Yeah, uh, Kevin, can you just talk briefly about uh, setting up the rules of play? So, for example, the rules, but also the the meaningful information. One thing we haven't discussed yet, but I think is important since all of us here are storytellers of some kind, is how you provide that meaningful information and how stories can help you do that. Yeah. Yeah, well, certainly the the information you feed back to your players is absolutely crucial because they're they're using that information to figure out to to make their decisions. You know, the act the act of playing the game again is an act of interpreting that information and making distinctions from it. Um, story in games, I think, actually have a really interesting relationship and um, and and fit together in different ways depending on what you're doing because all games become stories in their playing. And so, for instance, if I'm if I'm playing playing a game of chess against somebody else, and um, and a dramatic turnabout happens in that game, that's going to become a story. It's like, you know, hey, you remember that time when, you know, you know when you thought you had me, and uh, you know, and it turned it turned around. I mean, you know, you the you know it, certainly uh, you know ESPN pretty much makes a living doing that out of sports. Where essentially they're taking they're taking these these activities that happen in real time and making stories out of them after the fact. Um, narrative, uh, 
narrative can absolutely support the understanding of the game because it um, it's it's something we very it's something we understand as as you know very innately as people we're a storytelling animal and um, and and the I think the reason why narrative works so effectively with with people I mean, why we why we like watching movies and listening to stories is that uh, we're very attuned to build expectations from narrative so. You know, when, when somebody starts telling us a story, as soon as they do, we're already starting to starting to plan, look ahead. It's natural for us. We start to look ahead of that story and say, oh, what do I think is going to happen? And then a good storyteller subverts that. Um, but I think the, the act of engaging your player uh, in that process is so closely analogous to the core mechanic of a game, which is making those micro plans, that it really kind of does fit. If you can use narrative to... Um, help your player understand what the uh, you know what 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 the information being fed back to them means to give them context for that information and also to understand how to draw inferences from that under, from that that information so that they can begin to uh, begin to expect what they think will happen if they did certain things or so so Kevin tell us if we have a fork in the road tell us some give us a couple of different examples of information you would want to provide to the player to be able to make a decision about which direction to go? Absolutely, yeah. So uh, let's say uh, let's say your the narrative structure of your game is that you're uh, you're 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 trying to track down the lost snark, and uh, and when, when one of the uh, one of the pathways has uh, has something that appears to be footprints and the other one doesn't, that would be mm -hmm. a clue. Or uh, or maybe uh, maybe you've been given in a previous uh, you know previous you know example some idea of what sort of climate snarks like, and they say, oh, you know, snarks snarks really like wet climates and you look to the right and you can see it's like oh this looks like it leads down into a swamp and I see kind of mangrove looking trees and clouds and water and this here looks like it leads up into a mountain so the snark is probably to the right rather than to the left and I'm gonna go walk down that path to uh, to see whether or not I'm right I think those those would be examples I mean there's there's no one answer to how narrative and, and games fit together it's really contextual and actually there's a huge huge argument going on in academia about about this, I mean, the the, the so-called narratologists and the so-called ludologists have been at each other's throats for years, um, arguing about whether or not stories belong in games at all. And my my belief about that is that the answer is it depends on what you're doing. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, but yeah, those those would be examples. And so in a case like that, I mean, essentially, I've I've created a narrative expectation, and then use and now I use that narrative expectation to allow the player to frame their understanding of the feedback that I'm giving them. because now now those footprints have meaning or that swamp has meaning to them where you know absent that it wouldn't have it would simply have been oh well there's I could go to the swamp or I could go to the mountain but I have no idea what's what's where uh, very good uh, Emma and Kendra I know you joined a little late so I just wanted to see if you guys had any specific questions that we could ask Kevin before we wrap up here and if not that's totally fine too no thank you I'm just learning it's wonderful thank oh, you Mike good Emma okay very good well listen Kevin I mean we've covered a lot of territory obviously uh, this is a light topic but dense in terms of its complexity and I think you've done a really nice job of outlining some of the the complications but also making it very relatable to to different scenarios whether that be in a corporate setting whether that be in a more specifically educational uh, setting whether that's recreational or institutional and then also just you know regular old games of all kinds um, is there anything that you wanted to just cover before we wrap up here I wanted to give you a moment oh yeah okay uh, let's see well I think I think if you're if you're thinking about approaching a game design some of the most some of the most, most profitable things you can do in breaking down your your design is uh, is practice thinking about it in terms of its mechanics, its dynamics, and its aesthetics. Um, you know, this uh, this this is a thinking that arose from a, 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 a paper that was written a few years ago, and I'm completely spacing out who wrote it, but it's absolutely brilliant thinking. But the uh, what I mean by this is uh, the mechanics of your game are the physical elements of it, the uh, the tokens in your game. What are you moving around? You know, what 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 by what agency do you change the state of the game? And how does this game 
provide feedback back to you and um, and how, how are goals evaluated? How do you know whether or not you're succeeding or, or, or not? So for instance, you know, if, I, if my goal is simply to go and throw throw a ball through a, through a hoop, the mechanics of the game are the uh, the ball, the hoop, the act of throwing, and uh, you know, and, and the physics of the environment. You know, whether they're real world physics or or, or not. Um, those are your nuts and bolts. Those are the nouns in your game. Um, the dynamics of the game are how those things get used. You know, what what now happens? So, for example. Um, the mechanics of a chess game stipulate that the that a bishop moves on a diagonal and can move any any distance it wants to on the diagonal. Um, an example of a dynamic in a game is the act of pinning another piece. So now I've gone and placed my bishop, and uh, and it's threatening this my threatening my opponent's pawn. But my opponent now can't move that pawn because if they do, then this bishop is going to go and nail their their rook. So that that uh, you know that pawn is now essentially pinned in place because they need to go and do something else before they can, you know, before they can they can, um, you know, you know before they can they can uh, safely safely use it. That's an that's a dynamic. That's a that's a way that the system is used. Dynamics of the games produce the aesthetic experience. They produce the experience of 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 you know. You know, in the case of a chess game, of of planning ahead and 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 anticipating and trying to get your opponent stuck, trying to reduce your opponent's options while you broaden your own. Um, you know, the aesthetic experience of chess is an experience of thinking very deeply and planning as far ahead as you're capable, and then uh, and then and then seeing how successfully you did that. Um, but I, I really think that. It's 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 easy in looking at a design to get muddy about this stuff and to kind of. You know, and to be be indistinct about your your, you know, your mechanics, your aesthetics, and and you know, and, and how how the game functions. If you really kind of look at it mechanistically, I think you can um, you can uh, you can help clarify your design. You can help understand um, how how the design works, how how these mechanical elements create dynamics that then create the aesthetic experience that you want your player to have. Um, and then in thinking about and in understanding how those dynamics are going to unfold, I think the right way to do that is to think of games in terms of um, plans and results. Your player basically is making plans and evaluating results. They say, I, I think if I do this, this is going to happen. Oh, hey, I was right, and I know that I was right because the game gave me feedback. Or I was wrong, and I know that I was wrong because the game gave me feedback. Let me make a new plan based on, based on where I'm at. If you... If you think in terms of that cycle of making distinctions from information and then using those distinctions to to you know operate the mechanics of the game, that's how you can figure out what the dynamics of your game are really going to be because that's basically what your player is going to be doing with them. Um, I think in a nutshell, that's kind of an effective way of, of, of looking at design. I mean, there's there's a ton of other stuff you can explore in design, but at at, at a uh, at a at a core level, just thinking in thinking in terms of just how how the engine turns, you know, mm -hmm. and, uh, as as a player plays your game, that engine really is a cycle of, you know, uh, information, decision, result, new information, decision, result. Um, Very good. You know, and understanding that, you know, the mechanics are what they use, the dynamics are their process of using that, or of turning that cycle, the aesthetics are what that does to them, uh, what, what it makes them feel and what it makes them learn. Fantastic. Well, I think you've done a really nice job of laying out this uh, this game design 101 for us. Thank you so much, Kevin. I think our next step is to create a game about creating games, right? <laughs> It'll be a pretty exciting challenge, actually. So, hey, thank you, everybody, for joining, and we hope to have Kevin's course done this yeah. fall. So we really appreciate you uh, being a part of our Hangout. Please comment with any questions that you have in the actual uh, blog post that we sent out in the, in the email. And we'll be sure to address those questions in the actual course. Uh, Kevin, anything you'd like to plug for uh, White Moon Dreams or anything like that? I right, well, I mean, certainly if, if you guys are, uh, if, you're, if you like playing a turn-based tactics game, uh, War Machine Tactics is, uh, is up on Steam Early Access right now. And, uh, and it's it's actually kind of we we are very very engaged with our players. Uh, we uh, we're active on the forums and we pay we watch the live streams and pay a lot of attention to how people play the game. And that in itself is that's another thing that I could talk about in design. I mean just how iterative the process of design is. But uh, 
but it's it's pretty exciting for us to be designing and developing a game that has you know a few thousand live players already already in it because we find out a great deal about just what works and what doesn't and how it works, mm-hmm. and, uh, and and we try things out every 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 with every drop. I think that speaks to the importance of just getting it out there and testing it and gathering feedback as soon as you can. So critical, uh, absolutely critical. Design is conversation with the thing you're designing. You 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 can't do it in a uh, in a vacuum. You can't just write think you're going to write a perfect design. You've got to iterate, and you and the only way to iterate is to is to get it in people's hands and really see how it, how it plays to discover the dynamics. Yeah. Very good. Very good. Okay. Well, we'll see you uh, on the flip side once your course is up. Kevin, thank you again so much for joining, and everyone else, have a wonderful rest of the day. We'll get this uh, up for you soon. Okay. Thank you so much. Take care. Bye. Thanks.